Hi, it's Jordan Peterson here. You're listening to Parkour Coach Companion. It's not entirely clear that you're you're listening. I mean, it depends what you mean by listening. I mean, if you you're not listening, then, then it's blo- it's bloody hell. There is nothing better than seeing two forces come together and make a cracking collab vid. And this was the case in 2014 with the Leeds Boys and Street Media who came together and made this edit called Down For The Cause. You had like the dirty vibe of the Leeds Boys paired with really classy production by Joe O'Brien and some amazing editing to produce a classic which not enough people have talked about. It's a real shame to me that both these teams have kind of disbanded over the years but life moves on, people find new things to do and have new responsibilities. That's something that we discussed in today's episode with Eddie Ingram who's moved somewhat away from the parkour world has now gone deep into calisthenics and personal training. As coaches and practitioners, injuries are common in parkour, and Eddie gives some really good advice about ankles, functional movement, and even the old VEC method gets debated in there. So settle in, keep it locked for episode 27 with Eddie Ingram, AKA Alpha Chimp. <laughs> okay, we are back. Episode number 27, and today we are joined by Mr. Eddie Ingram, Alpha Chimp. How are you doing, sir? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm well. I feel I feel it's strange that we've not really crossed paths yet because I know we have some mutual friends and yeah, like I don't think we've ever met. Not in person, no. Uh, I've been following your stuff though. I've been following the, the coach companion and stuff and it is cool to see someone kind of uh, breaking open that world because there's so many people in parkour where I know their movement but I wouldn't even know the sound of their voice. You know what I mean, so it's cool to sort of hear people's background and, and sort of uh, see them more as an actual person rather than just an athlete or just for their movement so yeah I think it's really cool what you're doing there thank you man yeah I think there's so much depth that we're not that we're only just exploring now you know people's personalities people's mental processes people's uh, training methods you know there's so much interest mm. there and actually knowing someone as a, as a person rather than just yeah just seeing their movement um, there's a lot, lot to be said there. Anyway, um, I've got lots of things to throw at you, and uh, you're just gonna have to deal with it and see. We'll see what happens. But the first thing I wanted to ask you is, how did you come across sorcery? Sorcery? Oh, the music. <laughs> um, there's actually a chiropractor called Brett Jones, who's. A, I'd recommend everyone check him out. He does really, really good chiropractic videos. Mm. But his whole thing is he does like chiropractic music. So he'll put on these like weird, like trippy tunes and then he'll do like chiropractic kind of in tune with the, the music and he's just like vibing Whoa. and looking people in. <laughs> so that's how I got into it because I just heard it on that. Um, yeah. But yeah, man, I love that guy. What, when, when did you hear about it? When did you Well, get... I, so, so, yeah, I think I was just super happy you used one of his, well, I think you've used him twice, two of his tunes. Um because yeah, I don't think I've met any other one, anyone else that's heard of sorcery before. I think maybe it's declined a bit now, but a couple of years ago there was this kind of wave music kind of scene, mm. and I got into that through Plastician. Do you know the guy called Plastician? I've heard that. Okay, so yeah, he's quite a sort of big DJ. He does a lot of you know, makes music in a lot of different genres and things, and 
he made these like wave mixes. So he put on lots of artists that were making this kind of sound, this quite specific sound. And sorcery like stood out to me like easily. So um, yeah. yeah, I was I was dead into that. I did into that, and well, I still am, still am. I can, I can always put it on. That's cool. But I've never done it to like to like cracking backs or anything. I have to try that. <laughs> um, you can tell a lot about someone by their music taste. Yes, right. preach, preach, absolutely. Um, so my first my first thought, my first question relates to something that I was talking with Georgia Monroe about in one of the previous episodes. And we talked about how there's this aspect of treasure in parkour and that like many of us are just trying to find and grab this treasure. And this can come in the form of, you know, progression or learning something new or doing something new in a new place. But I've noticed that you, you know, I've been following you for a while and I, I know you've been training parkour for a long time, but I noticed you've kind of taken a slightly slightly uh, different journey now into calisthenics and functional mm. movement and I wonder I wanted to ask you like do you feel that there's more treasure in calisthenics for you do you feel like there's more to gain there than in parkour is that why you've changed or is it completely uh, or is that a completely different conversation so, so so the thing I like about calisthenics is that one you can train alone um which, I mean, I love the parkour community, and that's like one of the reasons I still like parkour, right? But um, I don't like to train parkour alone, and uh, I don't know if you follow Jimmy the Giant. Yeah. Um, but he did a really good video on like why it's weird to train parkour alone, and I mean, I, to say that obviously you can train it alone, and no disrespect to the people that do, but um, to be honest, that the scene kind of just died down in Derby. Mm. But I still wanted that feeling of progression. So that was kind of why I switched. Um, but my my route was kind of weird because I I was super deep into parkour. Like that was my entire life. Like if if you had asked me, okay, who are you? I'd say, okay, I'm a parkour athlete. Mm. And then I just happened to do this other stuff. You know. Um, but uh, what happened was I kept my ankles kept spraining, so they would sprain up, and then they would sprain to the left, and then they would sprain to the right. Mm. And it was almost like an adaptive mechanism. So my, my ankle didn't want to land properly, so it would freak out and then move to the opposite side, and then it would roll that side. So I was like, hmm, like what's going on? And that's when I started looking into um, rehab exercise and stuff like that, and that's that was kind of my route into that world, just because I wanted to fix myself. Mm. Uh, I also started learning more about neurology, uh, the nervous system and stuff like that, because... Um, it kind of highlighted to me, like, I know, I'm going on, on a tangent, I'll come back to the yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, no worries. It kind of highlighted to me, like, we're not, we're kind of in control, but you're also not in control. You know what I mean? Like, your body will, say, if I'm falling over, my body will sacrifice my arm and my shoulder and all this to protect my head, right? But I'm not thinking that consciously. Mm. So that was when I was looking into, like, neurology and, like, how... Um, the brain interfaces with the body and stuff like that um, but in terms of treasure I, I just kind of loop back so um, I think what I like is just the feeling of progression the feeling of progress so even if you were to cut off my arms and legs like next week I'd be like okay like you know I need to learn like maths or something or <laughs> you know what I mean like there's you just have to find ways to progress mm. with whatever you're doing so mm. currently it's calisthenics because uh, just because I have a passion for it, um, but like in a year it could be, I don't know, wakeboarding or surfing or I don't know, like something completely different. Mm, maybe we're just all pirates. Maybe the treasure isn't actually the thing. We're just all pirates seeking it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the feeling. It's if you if you follow uh, Jordan Peterson, he talks a lot about that. Like mm. pleasure is the feeling of going towards something. Um, mm -hmm. and I really think that like you have to just feel like you're progressing with whatever you're doing mm. so yeah but um, in terms of where there's more with calisthenics like objectively compared to parkour um, I think calisthenics fills a lot of the holes that parkour misses um, and they're just a really nice combination because um, like there's a reason why gymnasts do 
calisthenics conditioning, right? Mm. And uh, if you look at their injury rate, at the higher end, obviously everyone's getting injured. But like, I guarantee you they're probably getting l less issue um, injuries than parkour athletes who don't do much conditioning just because they're strengthening all the tendons and the joints and stuff like that. So I think that they they work well together. Obviously you can be too focused on conditioning and they're not actually training the real sport mm. or you can be too focused on the sport and doing not doing enough conditioning and then the body starts to break down. So mm. it's all about balance, I think. Yeah, and so do you think there's there just isn't that balance in parkour right now? Uh, well, I was actually saying this to, to Scott Jackson the other day, like it's, um, no, there isn't. Because if you look at any other sport, they have an on-season and an off-season, right? Mm. So they'll have a specified time where I need to peak and be at top performance, whereas parkour doesn't really have that. Um, and you kind of get it with the seasons. You get a natural, like people train more in the summer mm -hmm. and then kind of do more conditioning in the winter. Um, but now with parkour parks coming up, it's like you could train <laughs> year round and just be constantly trying to peak mm. um, rather than having s cyclical, you know, periods of training. Mm. Like, um, it's interesting. I forgot the question. It's all right. It's interesting, <laughs> these, these, this sort of terminology, because I can already feel like a slight um, kind of frick, like, like that kind of, terminology makes me slightly uncomfortable I have no well no I do know why it's because you know I'm an old head in parkour and I have this have this quite conditioned response that like parkour can be done whenever and I should just just go at my own pace and it doesn't matter about being I shouldn't have to set periods of time to do certain things and I think this is very like quite restrictive mindset um in this way that I'm I, I can hopefully break out of that you know maybe we do need pre-season and, and and this these sort of different uh mm. ideas i think it's just interesting like having that response in me i've always felt like Ugh, I, don't, I don't really like it but i guess that must relate to a lot of parkour people because as, because you're right people do just train all year round now and it probably mm. isn't the best idea it, it's like the idea of if i'm making a meal it takes a lot longer to make the meal than to eat the meal you know what i mean I have to assemble all the ingredients <laughs> and put it all together. It's like, no one really wants to do that. Everyone wants to eat the meal. <laughs> yeah. But like, you have to sometimes just put in the time. But um, I think... I like that. That's cool. I don't... I, I think it could be... Like, obviously... I mean, for me, I got way too into the strength and conditioning side. So I was like, mm. no conditioning at all. And then I went just conditioning and no actual sport. So for me, I was like this big pendulum. But I think <laughs> you could probably do it in a way where it's there's probably like a minimal amount like at least some ankle conditioning some knee conditioning mm. make sure even just getting the motor patterns correct so that when you land your knees aren't flaring out to the side which i see all the time with parkour people land like duck footed and then their knees flare out mm. and then uh you know a few years down the line it's like okay i've got like no meniscus left in my knees yeah and it's like yeah you're essentially twisting like and it's essentially over time that's like a drill like going through your meniscus layer so it's like yeah. making sure at least doing some conditioning so your motor patterns are correct so that when you land, your knees are coming forward. Mm. Things like that. Let's get into this then. So just giving some advice and some help for people that are listening. What sort of things would you, what, what would you recommend? You, you mentioned ankles and I think that is a big thing. You know, we, we joke about ankle thing, um, but whether that's actually really that funny in the long run because, you know, it can lead to, a number of different issues i know myself in my in my left ankle i have like an anterior impingement because mm. which is almost certainly to do with with <laughs> arm jumps and things and landing with my left foot forward all the time and now i have a strange like psychological aversion to um landing something with my left foot on top if that makes sense so like you know when you're yeah. prepping something and you, you usually stick one foot out to the top now my body will just, even if I take off my right foot, I'll swap to my right foot because it's like a, oh, okay. it's like a habitual thing of where my left foot just doesn't want to, doesn't want to go there, um, yeah. anticipating the pain. So, so maybe if we could just simplify it to ankles for now, like what would you, what would you uh, recommend for people doing parkour or 
in in this sense. So, so as a basic rule, I'd say you want say if you have the foot here, you want to do something up, right? So that would be pulling the toes towards my knee, right? You want to do something up, something down, something to the side, right? So just to like really simplify it. Mm. Um, so something down would be like a calf raise something up would be like a toe raise so you can even do that if you're just sitting down and just you raise your toe towards your knee so that's just going to strengthen the front side of the foot then the calf raise is obviously going to be the achilles and the back side and in terms of the side what you can do is um, if you're just standing up you literally just rock side to side on your feet okay so you're just standing and then you'd rock so your feet are doing this motion here yeah i'm trying it now so just for people <laughs> for people listening it's kind of you're rocking up onto the uh, the left side of your feet and then the right side and then lifting the opposite side up. So I think if you just have those three movements and you just do them like say three times a week, then you're ahead of everyone else, right? Because <laughs> who's doing ankle conditioning? Like no no one's doing ankle conditioning. So um, just just stuff like that um, would just be a good start. Just to, just to try and simplify it. Uh, obviously, it can get more complicated and um, you can add in, um, so after you've done that, it's, it'd be a good idea to add in some kind of rebound, some mm. rebounding. So that yeah. typically that would be um, skipping, but you could also do running on the balls of your feet. So just not letting your heel strike the ground. Uh, so something like that. I think that, that would be a good start. Nice. And for those listening who I've, I've not really introduced you properly, um, what is your position now? I mean, you've kind of taken things into your, into your own hands with your with your own work. Is it kind of freelance now, or are you part of a, a certain body? Uh, so, so originally I was just a, a standard personal trainer, um, just working in a gym. Um, but now I do. I sp- I'm, I've got a dual role, so I do exercise therapy, which is moving free- people from pain to normal movement. Nice. And then personal training, which is moving people from normal movement to higher performance. Mm. So I just see it as like a spectrum. And I was just, before I was operating on this side, whereas now I've kind of got the full spectrum. But um, yeah, so I'm half exercise therapist and half personal trainer. And I kind of split my time 50 50 with those. Mm. And so, how, how have you found the exercise therapy then? Because I guess it's it's quite a strong claim to say to someone like I'm going to get you out of pain back to normal. Um yeah. so do you find do you feel confident with that now or is that something that you've had to kind of well, adjust to? I, I, I never I never I would never say like okay I'm like going to cure your stuff. It's more like um I can give you advice and then this could help. Um but I never try and promise because, uh, you know, as an exercise therapist, I can't actually diagnose condition. Because right. you know, if I say, oh, okay, you've got this uh, hip impingement, then it turns out they've got like you know, cancer in their hip or something. Like, I'm, I don't know if you can swear on this, but I'm F. You know what I mean? Like, I'm screwed. Like, <laughs> um, So basically, I don't diagnose. Like, all I can do is like, oh, okay, well, this exercise may help. And because of my background, I've kind of got like a broad knowledge base because I've done gymnastics and powerlifting and sort of a range of sports so um, that's kind of how I got into it um, but yeah I know what you mean in terms of the responsibility of it um, mm. I see it more as I just I just give people advice mm. and then if they want to follow it they can and uh, if they just do it for a couple of weeks then they're like you know I can't be asked and that's their <laughs> their decision mm. So. Mm. something that drew me uh, Jimmy Edmund, I was looking at some of your posts, is this idea of like the big five. So is that something that you've decided or something you've uh, you've taken from somewhere else? The sort of big five movements that can help with with performance and so so the big five is so in terms of strengthening exercises, there's a really good channel called Mindful Mover where he identifies the big five strengthening movements. So if people are interested in that, I'd recommend checking him out. Mm. Um, the big five I talk about is usually flexibility orientated. So that would be, essentially it's a concept from gymnastics. So the big five would be 
forward fold, back bend, pancake, front split, side split. So if, essentially what it is is um, hip lateral motion, hip, so hip movement on the frontal plane okay, with the front split. Then you've got pancake, which is hip external rotation. And then you've got um, pancake and bridge, which are kind of a matched pair. So bridge would be an entire body back bend with your hands on the floor. And then pike is obviously just touching your toes on the ground. So the reason they're a matched pair is essentially when I'm in a back bend, I'm extending everything in my body. And when I'm in a forward fold, I'm compressing everything in my body, right? Mm. So you're just flopping from one way to another. <laughs> But the reason the big five are useful is because literally people go, okay, what stretches should I do? And uh, the thing I hate is like, oh, it depends. Like, oh, it depends on, it depends. It's like, just do these five. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like you'll get really flexible if you do these five. Mm -hmm. So um, that that's why they're useful. Um, but what I give my clients, I don't give them the actual big five because for most people, especially if they're not aiming for high performance, there's no, they don't need to do a side split. They don't need to be a, yeah. to do a front split or something. Yeah. So what I would give is like a modified version where you're still stretching the muscle on that plane, but just not with as extreme of a stretch. Um, so that's why I give the modified big five. But um, yeah, I've got a post on it. Um, in fact, I'll be releasing a video on it soon, but it's just a way to kind of simplify, okay, what stretches should I do? Hmm. And just get it down to like five five structure just, just to simplify the process yeah man i tried them yesterday i tried the not the actual big five but <laughs> i tried the sort of progression progressions and yeah nice my, my my whole lower section felt very very fluid afterwards i went for a walk and i was like oh yes i feel good <laughs> um, Can you take some progress photos you get some progress pictures i should i should shouldn't i i tell you what i'm my cossack squat is fine generally on both sides oh uh, you know i mentioned the impingement on my left hand side mm. i find it quite hard to get into full depth with the cossack squat on my left side but with my right side it's fine um but then what was i doing so i did the i was trying like the front the front fold like the jefferson curl type thing mm. um i used a bit of weight like to kind of help with that one that was good and then like the frog, is it the frog position? Like the frog kind of stretch? Mm. That's really good, that one. That that gets me. <laughs> um, you say, is it a hip impingement? Uh, ankle, ankle. Ankle, Yeah, okay. yeah. For, for, just so, so with my, with the Cossack squat going to the left, I have to really like kind of, sh not grind, but kind of like shuffle and slowly get into mm. it. It's quite difficult. I can't just go straight into it. Um, and then my bridges are pretty terrible, actually. And I'm ashamed to say that because I used to teach gymnastics. <laughs> but I find one thing is if I'm on any surface that is kind of not very grippy, my hands just immediately start moving away from me. So I can't, like on carpet, I'm just, I really struggle. And I guess that is a strength thing yeah. as well. But just I, my hands always kind of start moving away and it's an awful feeling. <laughs> it could be a sign that you need to get your hands further behind your because then because it could be that your your hands are kind of here and sliding this way when they need to be sort of tucked under yeah that's that that, that that could definitely <laughs> definitely play a part so um so yeah do you think that these big five would be useful for parkour practitioners then yeah definitely definitely um yeah uh just just at least a couple of times a week just doing running through the big five mm. um Keep it simple, mm. like don't don't overcomplicate it. Mm. Um, obviously, I mean, one thing I would like to do at some point is write a strength and conditioning book for parkour because um, there's not many people talking about like periodization and when to include certain things and mm. whatever. But um, in terms of stretching, I'd say ideally separate it from your power movement. So if you're doing a lot of power and plyometrics, I wouldn't stretch right before. I'll try and separate it to like the evening or something like that. Um, another thing that I think would really benefit parkour practitioners would be soft tissue work, just because um, you know your body takes a beating when you're training if you're training properly. So uh, incorporating you know myofascial work, um, looking to Graston. Graston is like a 
you can use a handheld, it's like a blunt blade, and what you do is run it oh, through yeah, the muscle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so Graston, foam rolling, massage balls, um, yeah, any kind of my fascial work just for recovery. And uh, specifically with that IT band. So mm. I, I don't know how many people I know from parkour <laughs> who have like, you know, either pulled or ruptured their IT band. Mm. But you really, really want to take care of that with any kind of running movement. So even just foam rolling on your IT, if you just search on YouTube, foam roll IT band or myofascial work IT band, I think that would be super useful um, for people. And that's just going to help to, to stabilize the knee joint as well. And and when when do you think people should do this? Is it is it after a session? Is it before a session? Is it on a different day? When would when do you think would be best? It, it depends on your weekly schedule, but I'd say um, evening time before bed is usually the best. Right, um, right. I, but just because, say, if you if you imagine you're training in the middle of the day, you don't want to stretch first thing because the body's really when you first wake up, like the, you can feel your body isn't flexible at all. Mm. So um, I'd say like before bed is the best time um, and just get, uh, my other advice would just be you want to be in, like as hot as possible. So ideally get a hot room. So I will literally like put on like sweats before <laughs> I do it because you want your body to be as, if you think of um, mm. just malleability yeah, 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 of, yeah. The, of the joints and everything, you want to be like slightly too hot um, and then just stretch and then just drink loads of water because... Right. If you're stretching properly, it's going to dehydrate you. So, mm. yeah. Interesting. So you want to be like my... you want to be like lava. You want to be <laughs> you you want to be as uncomfortable as possible. <laughs> you want to be stretching yourself out too hot and and hydrated. Right. Right. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And on that on that sort of on that note, I notice you've tried some yoga practices as well. So tell me about your thoughts on yoga and how they. Because we've I've I've had a yoga practitioner on an instructor sorry called uh, Yoga with Olive who who came onto the podcast and we had a really good talk and yoga is now something I've been trying to implement a bit more just mm. daily like um, and stretching in general I think that I have a lot to learn but um, I'm really enjoying yoga and I, I wondered whether you could share your experience with yoga and how it can tie into parkour training as well. Um. So, I mean, I got interested in yoga. Um, it, was, it was something I was originally, like, resistant to, which is kind of a theme that I've always had through my life. Like, I'll be like, oh, it's bullshit. Like, we get to the rope later, boom, I weigh the rope. But, like, that's just one of the things I just... Yeah, I always thought yoga was one of those things where it's a bit like... Yeah, like, it just seems a bit soft. But then I tried it, and I noticed my connective tissue felt a lot better. And there was also certain... It's really good at highlighting certain positions you can be flexible in a bunch of different ways. Like I could do the splits uh, when I first started yoga, but the, when it came to, uh, you know, like the lotus position where you're basically, it's just hip external rotation. And I couldn't, I couldn't even get close. And I was like, Oh my God, I was actually worse than most of the people there. <laughs> so I think it's really good for highlighting certain positions that you're, that you're inflexible in or that you're weak in. So um, what I'd recommend like in terms of yoga would be, at least go to a few classes and then uh, you'll have the kind of inventory of movements, um, you know, stored away. Um, and then you can just sort of create your own, uh, I say create your own yoga practice, but just like implement the movements into your own stretching routine. Um, but yeah, I think yoga is super useful. I actually, I was looking into the theory behind yoga. And if anyone's into yoga, I'd recommend looking into the because the theory is more interesting than the practice. Right, interesting. In what way? So, from from my understanding of yoga, they they view the bones as and the bone is kind of like an antenna system. So you know with an antenna how I can uh, modify the antenna and it'll pick up a different frequency. And if I modify it again, it'll pick up a different uh, a different you know stream of vibration. So mm. the idea behind yoga is that the the bones act as the antenna system for the body for receiving levels of consciousness. This is very like, like we were, I'm not, I'm not saying I necessarily believe this, but I just think it's interesting. So their idea was that by positioning the body in a certain position, they could then pick up uh, a different like level of consciousness. 
So it's super interesting. Like, it, wow. like, not not many people look into the theory, but the theory is like really interesting. Like, whether you, whether or not you believe it is like it's still interesting to learn. Absolutely. I noticed behind you, you've got the the lotus position on show. The, yeah, <laughs> you've got the the Buddha, the Buddha himself, Buddha. <laughs> mm, the big guy. Have you have you studied Buddhism? Uh, kind of. Um, uh, I think I'm. Um, more more so when I was younger, I was into that stuff. Um, but I think I've kind of learned enough. Um, but like I was saying the other day to my friend, like, because I used to try and meditate like an hour a day. I was like super like uh, diligent with it. Mm. Uh, but I kind of realized like I'm not a monk. I'm not a meditator. Like I'm an, I, I'm a personal trainer. <laughs> so it's more useful for me to spend that time learning or working with clients rather than... Mm meditating because that's not my job so i think that it's the same with training like you want to do like the minimal amount that you need to do and no more because you know if you can do 20 minutes of meditation and then get the same bent or a similar benefit to doing like two hours then why not just do the 20 minutes and then you know you, you've got all the extra time to do what you want so min, minimum effective dose i think yeah, I've noticed this idea with the mindful mover and his his philosophy of smart training. Maybe people as mm. well like fitness FAQs if you've if you've watched his stuff. Um, mm. And yeah, I guess it, I guess it makes a lot of sense, and I can kind of see it playing out in parkour as well because I think you know credit to them, but a lot of the sort of original movers in parkour started to do you know, a lot of conditioning and I say a lot on purpose because <laughs> their their sort of mindset was more based on endurance and high reps and things. And and I remember reading an article, I think Blaine wrote an article about this and about how he was saying that he was doing, he'd go off to like a gym hall and do like a thousand lunges or something ridiculous. And then mm. realize once he started getting into weight training, or more effective methods that he was essentially wasting his time, um, yeah. and he kind of had to had to sort of laugh to himself that he'd, he'd wasted this time, but but managed to find something that was more more useful. Um, but I, if I can just say something on that topic, I think because um, you know there's the idea of like the ten thousand hours or like ten thousand repetitions. People say like, and I think with that it's. Um, it's important to make sure we want to do everything as perfectly as possible. So there's no point doing with like 9,000 poor repetitions and then 1,000 good ones. So I think um, quality is really important. Mm. So like mindful repetition. So every time you do a repetition of something, you should be trying to improve it. Um, but I think there's definitely a thing, like I see it all the time with fitness where it's, you're just trying to get, the reps out and then compromising form um and it's just like you're you're teaching your body m bad movement patterns at that point um so it's just better to do everything as perfectly as possible mm. mm -hmm. um and i wanted to ask you about this this pyramid idea that you i noticed in mm. in in your post as well the functional movement pyramid can you take us can you take us through the levels of this pyramid i'm interested I'd love to. So um, the functional movement pyramid was it was basically my attempt to, to systematize kind of all movements, which obviously doesn't, <laughs> it's not actually possible. Hmm. But it's, uh, again, trying to get away from that, like, it depends idea and just create a concrete, okay, go through the pyramid. Like, <laughs> it creates a more practical approach. Hmm. Um, so the, the top of the pyramid is static positions. So that's um, lying, sitting, um, and hanging, uh, and sorry, lying, standing, sitting, and hanging. Mm. Um, so the reason that these are the bottom is because, so for example, if I stand with my head forwards like this, I'm going to be then walking with my head forwards and running with my head forwards. Mm. So this is getting to the root of uh, the issue would be, okay, fix how you stand, and then that should hopefully fix how you walk and move on to the later stages. So the start is just static positions. From there, you move on to um, locomotion. So this is crawling and walking. So 
The reason I include crawling is because essentially if, if someone crawls in a dysfunctional way, they usually walk in a dysfunctional way. The two are interconnected because obviously everyone's prerequisite to walking is crawling. Like we all crawl first and then we walk. Um, so what you sometimes need to do with people is take them back to crawling and then teach them how to crawl properly and then that improves their, their gait, their walk. Mm. So you have basic locomotion and then from there you move on to what I call the six archetypal movements which would be push, pull, twist, squat, lunge, hinge. So these are basically six movements that will basically like picking something up, um, squatting down, things like that, twisting, pushing something, pulling something. It's just like very kind of simple basic movements. Um, and then from there you essentially get those movements and you either add load add speed or change the leverage so you get the proceeding layers and just manipulate those three variables so essentially it's, it's maybe it sounds more complicated when i'm saying it but it's easier if you actually see the pyramid because mm. then you can sort of work your way through yeah um and, and see how it all fits together but for example if i'm playing tennis right i'll be running twisting lunging <laughs> you know twisting my upper body like maybe adding some push like so essentially you can see that with most sports there's some combination of these movements mm, okay mm. so for example with um if we take a, a walk i can either add load so that would be like a carry like a farmer's carry or i can add speed so the, the walk becomes a run uh, so essentially that that my aim was just to create a kind of a systematic way to sort of understand movement um, and it also applies to um, creating a training program because then you can go okay so what are you doing for each of these movements so some form of squat is probably good, some form of push, some form of pull, stuff like that. Um, but I think there could be something as well, I've not really gone deeper into this, but in terms of periodizing training, so one period could be focused on loaded movements, the next could be focused on fast movements, the next could be focused on leverage, change of the leverage. So for example with pull, change of the leverage could be pulling with one arm, doing like a one arm chin up, mm. something like that. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's kind of long-winded, but it's easier if you if you look through the pyramid, then hopefully it makes sense. Nice. Yeah, it looked really interesting. It looked quite... Um, I liked how you, you you stripped it right down to the basics, like crawling, sanding, sitting. Because mm. I think you're right, maybe if we do look at the roots of these things more, you know, it's easy to see a complex movement and try desperately to figure out what's wrong with it. But actually, yeah, if you if you then strip it down to these basics, then we can see the see these uh, dysfunctional patterns and things. Um, and a question that just occurred to me while, while you're talking there is you mentioned this idea of like, it. you're not a big fan of it depends. Mm. And um, I wonder what you think of this in terms of parkour coaching then, because I've had a number of guests on now and they, there's been a, a difference in opinion in how we teach people. Some some coaches are more on the side of well, it depends. <laughs> we should we should mm. look at the kind of individual facets of a person who we're teaching and then try and adapt our coaching practice to that. But then some people are more prescriptive and think that there's certain things that that should be pretty mandatory in parkour coaching. Would you say you're along the latter side? Then do you think there should be more prescriptive? teaching methods in in parkour yeah that's interesting i mean i've i've uh i only really i've only coached parkour a bit at uni so i did uh i ran the parkour society and we did some coaching for that <laughs> but i didn't really know what i was doing back then so yeah um but yeah i would i'd be more on build a framework and operate within that framework so for example um yeah i think it would make sense to go systematic okay everyone should be able to do some form of climb up some form of standing precision some form of running precision some form of kong vault speed vault like i think yeah having categories but then if someone comes said okay i've got a hip impingement or you know i had my hips replaced last year or something they'd be like okay well i'm probably not gonna do that or you know i'm missing my hand okay we're not gonna do climate i mean but you i think it's important to have the framework in place and then go it depends within the, the framework if you just go from the start like and that's my problem with kind of movement culture in general. Um, 
is like it's just too like mo- when you say movement like this is move like moving my hand you know what I mean like everything's <laughs> movement so you need to create certain um frameworks and structures and then operate within that framework mm. so um, i think that the problem would be it has to be balanced right because if you're too loosey-goosey with it then it just becomes like confusing to people and it's like they've got no direction you have to create the structure first but then if you're too like oh everyone needs to do a climb up and they have to do a climb up exactly this way and if they don't do it this way then it's wrong like then you're too you flip to the other side right so I think it's important to be in the middle. So you have you have the structure in place, but then you can operate within that. Um, but I think that's where having um, experienced and intelligent coaches come in. Because if, if it's an intelligent coach, they they're going to understand it at a level where they can adapt it for the individual. Um, and I think this just goes with coaching in general. They they don't need to be super pres- like prescriptive with things because they have an advanced level of understanding. So um, you can see, I mean, I I see this in personal trainers where they'll be coaching someone and and they'll be training them and they'll be like trying to prove something. They'll be saying, oh yeah, this is uh, contracting the quadratus lumborum and my hips going into abduction. And it's like, for most people, like they don't even understand what you're saying and you're just trying to sound smart. (laughs) So I think it's like, if you're a good coach, you should be able to just, you understand the theory and then you adapt it for the person and then you don't overcomplicate it and you just do like, okay, just do this, like do this, you know, like rather than trying to sound smart or something. But I think I kind of went off topic, but you kind of get, get what I mean, I think. I get what you mean, yeah. I think the reason I ask is because we are at such a young stage with parkour coaching and that there isn't really any syllabuses. There's, <laughs> we're kind of one of the reasons I wanted to start this is because it feels like we are quite disjointed. There's no, you know, there's nothing to, re- there's not much to read that tells you how to coach parkour. So I, I, I kind of, I wonder, and also I'm slightly concerned about what people are actually, what are people teaching? Cause it's not at the moment, it's very, very free. Um, what would you put as the fundamentals? fundamentals well something that i teach with kids is like a, this idea of a toolbox so it it links in what, with what you're saying about having a framework i think that if kids understand that we need to use tools to be able to do what we want to do and that we can't just do what we whatever we want to do first um then it can help them understand what progression looks and feels like so for me part of this toolbox is like you know i remember in one session I literally got out a huge whiteboard and drew a picture of a toolbox on it and then said like, okay, kids, like, come over. We're going to have a quick, you know, five minute. We're going to talk about this. And we, I, I, I said, I went through the, the main vaults. So, you know, step vault, seat turn, lazy vault. Um, and I don't know, something else. <laughs> I can't think on the spot, but, um, and just said like, these are four tools that you can use and that will help you to get to get better. So let's practice those tools, see if we can get good at them. And then we're going to try and apply them into other situations. And you can always, and what I said to them is, you can always come back to this toolbox. Once you've got it, you can always come back to it. So it's kind of like just having things in their mind because as well, you know, we take for granted the terminology of parkour. We, we know what we're talking about. We understand the language. Yeah. It's kind of what you just said with, with, with PT instruction as well. But for people who are literally coming into it, there has to be an element of learning this language and learning mm. because you need sticking points in your mind. You can't just, if you, I, I know from experience, if you just get a new student and just say, right, we're going to do free movement expression with this rail for 30 seconds, go. They have no <laughs> yeah, idea what to do. They have no idea what yeah. to do. They're physically capable. They might be quite active. They might be quite athletic, but... They need sticking points. They need tools. They need memory points to to give them something to to go on. Um, so I would say that aspects like this are kind of what I try and implement as fundamentals. But then also I I've, I've trying to take in principles. You know, like what what principles underline the fundamentals. 
Um, yeah. So you could say like perfectionism with a small p. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. try, trying to make sure that you're being harsh on yourself and like that you that you want to try and do things well and not just just doing them. And then things like um, encouragement to other people, things like um, touch and sensitivity and environmental awareness. I think these are all super, super important, like fundamentals. So, I think the, the issue you always run into is like the it depends thing is like true. It's actually correct. <laughs> but then it's like you don't want to. It's just not useful. Um, but I was just even thinking then if there was some way to to break it down it's almost like a, a tree right it's like a branching tree so if you had for example precision jump that could just start with just like a broad jump and then uh that becomes a precision jump which becomes a precision precision jump to a rail which becomes to a prison jump to a rail with a drop or something so there is probably a way to systematize into kind of a branching tree structure for example kong becomes double kong or something. do you know what i mean like everything like so there probably is a way to to map out the basics, but uh, I don't I don't have time to do that. But someone, <laughs> someone else could do that. <laughs> yeah, I think I think there has been these sort of movement trees that I've seen actually in graphics um, that people mm. have put. There's a there's a group on Facebook if people are interested called Parkour Research. And it's actually got quite a lot of people on it. Um, I need to spend more time there, but I remember someone trying to essentially um, make a a web of of parkour movements and how cool. and how they split and it's just it might be it might be useful um but yeah oh i had a good question there where's it gone uh that's completely left me now oh yes yes so yeah i wanted to ask you about your progression videos because i think that is very linked mm. with what you just said um i watched your backflip progression video and you talk about you know, well, sorry, you don't talk about, you display how you can get comfortable with going to backflip. So t- talk me through them and do you have plans to do to do more of these sort of things? Yeah, so I, I, th- I think with most things, cartwheel is the gateway. Like if you learn cartwheel, that like opens the door to everything else. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, I think for most people, um, it's just getting comfortable being upside down. It's really useful. Um, in terms of the actual progression videos, um, I think it's just a useful way to kind of take the end goal and then proceed backwards. Then you can also go forwards from there as well. Um, but yeah, I think uh, it's something I definitely want to do more. I don't really think that much about them. I just think like, to me, it just seems like logical. Like that's how you do it. Um, would you mind pausing one second? I just have to go to the loop. Go for it. <laughs> And Alpha Chimp has run to the toilet in a dramatic sprint, perfectly aligned. <laughs> While he's gone, listeners, it's interesting how in this episode we have gone a bit all over the place, and it's because I've felt strangely self conscious this episode. I don't know why, just slightly different in my mind. I feel a little bit more aware of how I'm speaking which is making my confidence go down but yeah anyway he's back now so let's see how it goes <laughs> that was pretty rapid cheers mate I was dying yeah, I, was, no. I was trying to like concentrate on your question but I was like oh this is just too much <laughs> no no worries no I've, I've, I've been there I've been there um, <laughs> okay yeah so we're back we were kind of on the progression video thing um, yeah, you're talking about cartwheels and how they're the, the doorways. Yeah. Um, but if you, if you have cartwheel, then you can get um, one-handed cartwheel, then you can get aerial. And by that point, you're actually doing a somersault. So it's like, I think even psychologically, that's like a good point to get to. Because if you can do an aerial, that's that's uh, you're doing a somersault, essentially, at that point. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously it's different because obviously when, when you get people going backwards... The backflips, like I mean, I'm sure you know this. Like, that's a really scary thing for people. Yeah. Um. But uh, yeah, I think just that's that's where coaching skill comes in again mm. to find the right progression for people, um, and not 
if you have a lot of ego, then you can just want to sort of show off to people. Mm. And I've been guilty of this before. Um, when I've been coaching people in like acrobatic stuff, is you you uh, you just try and show off, and it's like it's just not useful for the person that's trying to learn. So yeah, I think that's really important. Just like leaving your ego aside and just think, okay, how can I actually help this person? And even if that moves means moving back like ten steps, then like you you have to just go back to those ten steps and then work back up. But I I you know I had an issue where. Um, moving, especially moving from free running to then going into rehab exercise, because my think for me it was just normal. Like, oh, everyone can do a backflip, everyone can do handstands. Like, it's just generally like just just try it. You like you probably do it. <laughs> um, whereas moving to rehab, it's like okay, like actually helping people to like walk and like stand mm. properly. And so that was a really eye-opening thing for me. Yeah, very. Very valuable work, I think. I've, you know, I've been on the end of some injuries and I've asked out for help, and it's amazing how your quality of life can be affected by injury mm. and like your mental health and all sorts. And so I, I have huge respect for people in your field. Uh, you know, people like uh, so Chris Scott, who I'm sure you know. Mm. Um, He's really smart. Man. He is. He is. M- maybe Chris, if you're listening. I'll try and persuade you to come on. Um, yeah, come out of the shadows. <laughs> Go on, share. He needs to write a book. I've been telling him for ages he needs to write a book. Wow, well, I think it'll be read by a lot of people. Um, but yeah, he's helped me a number of times out of injuries. And yeah, if people are listening, then definitely get in touch with people like Chris and Eddie if you are struggling with injuries in parkour. It's, it's no use, you know, just trying to rest and just think that it'll go away and and then getting hyped and then injuring yourself again you know this 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 is a yeah. this is actually a problem in parkour that i think that maybe we joke about but it's not really taken seriously enough until people are actually like a bit fucked <laughs> so it, it, it it's one thing i think it's kind of almost accepted as a given in some ways like yeah, yeah. oh if you train you're going to get patella tendonitis and it's like no like <laughs> that's not like a normal thing you know what i mean like you shouldn't be getting patella tendonitis mm. like, um so yeah i think um yeah and i think it's you you have to look after your your vehicle and not not treat it as like especially with parkour like most people don't plan on doing parkour past like past like you know 25 to 30 whereas i my thinking now is like okay how could i train till i'm like 60 you know what i mean like how could i because you know it's just part of getting older i think your your uh your view of time expands right mm. So now I'm thinking, okay, like, because there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to do it. You know, I mean, like, if you, if you take people that are in parkour now, their bone density is going to be so much higher than the average population. Mm. Um, so that they're, they're going to have these really strong bones. And the only thing that gets compromised is tendons uh, and uh, meniscus and like just the sort of collagen fibers and stuff like that. So I think if you take care of that stuff, like, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to train up until old age. Like maybe your training will change, but you should be able to do it for a long time. You know? Yeah, I, I sincerely hope so and plan to. <laughs> um, I think as well that's something that I struggle with in coaching. In that, I, I have a conflict in my mind of how to help people progress because sometimes you want to sometimes you want to and can help someone progress within one hour and it can feel amazing for you and for them you know imagine if they're trying to get a a cat pass a kong whatever uh in one hour and you provide them the guidance to do that but then also i have the conflict arises because the other part of my head is like well hang on if we if we're preaching about parkour for life if we're preaching about parkour for for longevity, for 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 global fitness, for for lifelong health. How slowly should people progress? How how what what is the sort of the curve of intensity that we mm. that we that we provide to people, or that they are, or that they are following themselves? And so sometimes I'm 
I kind of have this feeling that, like we really should be patient <laughs> if you yeah. want to actually be really sick at parkour especially when you're younger and you're you're slowly climbing towards your physical peak like maybe those years should be in some ways having absolute fundamentals like to an absolute t and mm. being so incredibly adaptable that once you're once you're in your prime strength then you become an absolute force um but then that's that's not that's more that's more a patient way of viewing it rather than you know that might put a lot of people off people want progression and it's so hard man it's yeah i, I don't i don't know if it would necessarily i don't know if it should necessarily take a long time I, th- I think it's again like i said about making a cake like i think once you've ingrained a motor pattern that's kind of the hard bit right so when you're first starting to kong it's kind of like okay where do my feet go where do my hands go whereas now if you do a kong you don't even need to think about it right it just happens so i think it's like and you could like i know for example for me now like i probably haven't done a kong in like a year but <laughs> i know i could go and do like mm. kong pre or is it just because it's like i've ingrained it into my body right that's the idea of like engram so it's, it's encoded in my body in my nervous system it's the idea of so what, i think sorry? like it's called uh, engrams I've never heard. Ingram. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of that. I've never heard that before. Yeah, it's really it, it's it's uh, really useful to look into, like how the process of how something gets encoded into your body, and it's the same. If, like if you tried learning guitar, just getting your fingers to go to the chords, mm. right? Once it's built in, you don't actually really need to do it anymore. Like obviously, the more you do it, the faster, and the more efficient you get. Yeah, but essentially, it's just the process of like building. Uh, motor programs into your body but once they're built in that's kind of like it, then it's just kind of fine tuning it you know? um, so I don't know if it is necessarily like a slow process I know it gets slower as you get older but um, I think once once you've kind of encoded the key patterns then I think it's just a case of kind of stopping them like just just keeping your vehicle intact right? keeping your body intact so it can perform them well um, I'm sure you've 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 tried this. Like, say, if you haven't done a move for a long time, and you come back, and it's like the first couple, maybe it doesn't feel right, but like, then as you repeat it, it's like it feels fine mm. because it's you you built it into the the body. So, mm. and the mind as well. You you your mind. Mm. It's not something brand new for your mind to contend with. It's something that you've you've gone through the motions of before. Um, and and I I got maybe a couple more questions then we'll go on to some Instagram questions for you. We have a couple which I'm pleased about cuz uh I give people like an hour to try and give <laughs> to try, just to sort of um force people to give me questions. <laughs> um so yeah, so you've you've been physical for a long time. You've been very much in the progression mindset in different aspects of your life and and currently you're kind of in this calisthenics world. Um, tell tell us about your feelings of progression within calisthenics. And maybe, you know, we started this conversation talking about treasure. So within the space of time that you've been kind of focusing more on these things than, than perhaps just pure parkour training, tell us about what you've experienced uh, and what you've gained from 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 this new kind of shift. So, so um, I mean, uh, I actually did after I, I say I quit parkour. I didn't. I won't really say I quit. I'd say I just kind of I needed some time to, to rebuild and figure things out because I just kept getting injured. Um, but originally, I actually did powerlifting. So I did powerlifting for like three years, uh, and I got up to some pretty good numbers. I got like. 145 kilo bench, 190 kilo squat, and 210 deadlift. So I was kind of okay numbers. Um, but I was moving to where <laughs> I was going to compete. Um, and then the problem with with uh, powerlifting is that it's uh, it's kind of like tricking your brain. So every time you get a new PB, you get this hit of dopamine. Like, oh, I, I've won, and then that sort of fades away, and it's like, okay, no, I need to get the next one. So it's kind of like almost like an addictive cycle right because it's just but it doesn't go anywhere like you're just adding 2.5 kilos to your, your bench every month or something um so that's the reason I, I decided to go into calisthenics 
um, was just because there's so much variety. And like, you know, like we're saying with trees, you can get handstand and then you can go like 20 different directions with it. You can go into like one arm or handstand press up or straddle press or stolder press or something like that. So the re that's the reason I like calisthenics is because there's so much variety involved. Um, but what I've also noticed is, um, whereas when I was training powerlifting, if I was to come back and try flips, I would feel like heavy and stiff and I would land and like my body felt like sort of almost slow. I don't think it has to with powerlifting. I think you can do it in like a fast way. But um, what I've noticed now is with calisthenics, I can train calisthenics and not do flips for like a few months. And then I'll come back and I'll be better at flips. But there's some kind of free gains um, that you get through calisthenics, um, which makes sense because like, you know, all gymnasts do calisthenics. So, um, but yeah, I just, um, for me, it's just like an interesting way to progress and um, just to add different things to my toolkit. Mm. Um, I think I also feel there's something about adding a, a at least a, a small layer of muscle mass that helps to protect the body. Um, and like, I know I could, I, it'd be very hard for me right now to sprain my ankle, right? It'd be very, very hard mm. to, I don't think I've been injured in like ages because it's, even if I get something slightly out of position, like it's kind of all right. It's kind of hard. You, you just become harder to injure, I think. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I'd love to become harder to injure. That, that would be nice. That'd be very nice. Indestructible. Mm. And so you're kind of on the on like handstand press ups now, one arm chins, mm. uh, handstand. Wait, I, I forget the terminology. Like stolder press. Is that where you start? I, I always forget which. Uh, I can do straddle press. Straddle. I can do stolder press. Yeah, I'm still. Tell me the profession. difference between those. I get. I get confused. So stolder is where your your hands are on the floor and then your your legs are kind of in a pancake position. So your legs are mm. at, at right angles to each other, and your your feet are off the floor. And then from that you'd press into a handstand. Mm -hmm. um, straddle press is where you start in kind of like a forward fold position, and then your legs come up at the side and then reach at the mm -hmm. top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm so I'm kind of on there, but um, I still don't really class myself as like very advanced in. Calisthenics, like I'm, I'm advanced at certain things, like one arm chins. But that was only because I used to do a lot of weighted chin ups. So, but when it came to one arm chins, I, th I don't think I even really trained it. I was just like, I just tried it, and I was like, oh, I can do it. So, um, but uh, yeah, my, I mean, that's my aim at the minute, just to progress with that, get better with that, and um, it has a ki high carryover to things like climbing as well, mm -hmm. which I like. Mm -hmm. um, and parkour so i think i think calisthenics is is a really useful discipline to even just get the foundations of absolutely yeah um and what while we're here I, I need to ask you about something contentious uh yeah. and then we'll, and then we'll move on to the the, the audience <laughs> questions so i know you you're you're friends with with tim tim sheaf Mm, well, okay. well actually yeah. sorry i assume you are i know you you're from the same yeah. city and everything um tim has been a hugely influential character in the parkour community um i met him a couple of times i've spoken to him i've followed him for a long long time and yeah it, it, without doubt he is part of the history of parkour now i would say mm. uh, at least in this kind of modern uh, 2000s era um, Tim in a similar way to yourself sounds like he is very curious and very um, motivated to progress and so his mind has taken him into lots of different practices and things and to me I mean you can say what you want about Tim but he looks like a fucking beast like he looks so strong and mm. um, you know he's kind of got this almost gorilla kind of um mesomorph body type. yeah yeah <laughs> and yeah. i i i think i'll always respect him for the feats that he's completed and sorry not completed the feats that he's achieved and in, in, in parkour and ninja warrior and everything and stuff like that um so shouts to tim if you're listening man um much respect much respect he's in he's been more into 
this VEC method recently. Well, actually, not that recently. It's maybe in a few years now. I don't know. But and I noticed that his rope training is something that you've tried as well. Um, yeah. I love the look of it. But tell me, is it is it all that? Like, what's it about? Is does it is it helpful? Is it um, is it a gimmick? That's kind of my question. Yeah. So so with Tim, like, um, we just kind of had a bunch of like kind of synchronized meetings. So I don't know if you know the concept of like synchronicity, um, but we just kept sort of happening to meet each other. <laughs> um, first through parkour, then he was just at my gym, and that's where I first saw him doing the rope because and again like at first I, I'm just kind of I think I have like a natural cynicism towards a lot of things mm. um, but I saw the rope and I was like I know it looked like fast and stuff but I didn't really see the application um, but it was only once I started to try it that I noticed like the my quality of movement improved a lot um, but the reason I, I really got into the rope was um, when I started to work, because I work at a chiropractic clinic, cause, so most of the people there have um, back issues, right? So when you have an issue with the spine, the back will contract like this. So mm. get, it's almost like harder to breathe. So you can get this shallow breathing and like the whole the whole core is tensed up, right? So what I like with the rope is that you can actually start to, it's almost like you're trying to separate your pelvis and your shoulders, right? So they can move independently like this which was something I, I saw missing with my patients because they would be, everything's locked up. And if they were to run, they would literally run their torso, would just go up and down <laughs> like this. There would be no rolling of the shoulders. Um, so for me, it was something I had to train with it first and experience it and then apply it to other people. And then I was like, okay, there's actually something here. Like it makes sense. Mm-hmm. So um, I think... Uh, it's one of those things, I think if people just try it, like first just literally get a, a skipping rope or something and just try even just like a basic underhand pattern, um, they can see. But like I said, I'm not like, I don't know whether it's like the most important thing um, with training is to do the rope, but you know, I think it's like a really useful thing um, for people to try. Um, and yeah, but it's, it, I think you have to experience it first. You can't, like, you could say all the, the, the benefits, you could speak it, but until you've tried it, you can't really, you don't really know. So it's only, it's only when you sort of try it, you kind of get a feel for it. But there's something about, like I say, separating the pelvis and the shoulders so they can move independently. Mm. And then also ingraining the motor pattern of this kind of figure eight, scooping the shoulders. Um, so th- those two things alone, I think it's good for. Um, but I think it's you know it's just a a tool a tool for the toolkit. <laughs> yeah. No, um, I-, I think it looks great. <laughs> you know, I've, I've been watching it and I think it looks looks cool. I love to try a little bit of it, and I think the spine is clearly something so integral to our well being. Mm. Um, and something central controller. Hmm. We don't really talk about it's like the video game, the video game controller of the body. I like that. I like that. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Thanks for speaking on that. Um, and again, shouts to Tim. Uh, stay curious, man. Keep keep uh, keep uh, looking into these areas which people don't always want to to look into. Um, I respect people like that, man. It's it's cool. Um, okay, let's go on to some some questions. So I'm um, just looking at my Instagram now and I've had two questions of a very similar vein from Shamila Photography and she asks, how do you know if you're hypermobile and should we avoid stretching if we are hypermobile? Okay, this this is a really good question. Um, so, yeah, so for, just for, for people that don't really know, so hypermobility is kind of a spectrum. So it goes from slightly hypermobile and then it goes into things I think it's called like um, Ehlers-Danos Syndrome or something I'm not sure how you pronounce it but essentially it's kind of everyone's on kind of a spectrum of hypermobility so um, hypermobility is actually basically a problem with collagen formation so collagen is meant to be elastic but then also able to become rigid right so um, with with a lot of the people I'm working with we're actually they're too rigid 
they were trying to make it more elastic. Mm. Um, but with in terms of hypermobility, um, there are mobility tests you can do, um, but really you, you you need to get your 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 blood tested really and your collagen tested and stuff to actually see if you because it, it's it's more a problem with the the collagen formation. Mm. Uh, so someone could be very flexible but not hypermobile. So hypermobility is more like the actual collagen fibers themselves aren't working properly. They're not providing enough structure. Right, um, right. But one interesting thing you get with hypermobility is uh, anxiety disorders. Mm. So there's no, um, this isn't like a proven theory, but what it seems to be is the body is essentially feels unstable, right? So then that sends feedback to the brain that says, I'm not secure, I'm not stable. Mm. So then it creates this kind of underlying anxiety. Um, so there's some kind of connection there um, and some connection with the gut as well. Because I know some people <laughs> with hypermobility, they do gut healing mm. protocols um, and they have success with that. So um, I don't really understand the, the sort of the scientific, but you can do, you basically you want to get like your blood tested and stuff like that. Um, you want to go to a doctor to see if you're hypermobile. It's not necessarily a problem with your mobility. It'll be a problem with your collagen formation. Um that's fascinating, but, man. Um, mm. It's a re- it's a re- it's an interesting thing. Mm. Um, I think there's a still a lot we don't understand about um, the gut and how the gut interfaces with the brain and stuff like that, and then how that influences the body. Um, Have you looked into if, the vagus nerve before? Kind of. I've I've kind of looked into it. I, it's, it's again like that natural cynicism because <laughs> everyone's going, oh, the vagus nerve is the best, the vagus nerve. And I was kind of like, yeah, is it? Um, but uh, no, do you know much about the vagus nerve? <laughs> you looked into it? Oh, um, ooh, yeah. I can't, I can't say with much confidence, no. I've been learning about it more with uh, Flynn Disney's online exploration group. We've looked into the vagus nerve and how it can relate to the gut and gut feeling and awareness of danger these sort of things um i I don't have much authority to speak on on it i'll I'll kind of butcher it but it seems very interesting and i think it does relate to what you've just been talking about with similar issues you know anxiety and responding to stimuli in certain certain ways um just to say a bit on anxiety in general i i mean uh, I've studied psychology, right? So I kind of have a rough idea of how anxiety works. But I think um, stuff like parkour is so good for relieving anxiety because essentially what, what anxiety is, is you're predicting that a future stimulus is going to cause you harm, right? So I think there's there's almost an effect now where because we're always in warm rooms that, and in comfy chairs, right? So your body is anticipating a certain level of stress from its environment and then it's not mm-hmm. getting that stress so you're always in the state of ang- anticipation so i think that's why a lot of people mm. are anxious nowadays but i think there's something about um especially parkour where you're having high impact um through the body right the body's taking impact it's almost like it's expecting something and then it gets it you know what i mean it's like it's being fed a certain amount of sympathetic stimulus um, to the nervous system, um, but yeah, I think there, there's something uh, there's something about impact training hmm. that's um, really good for either relieving anxiety or just preventing anxiety from happening. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Just my opinion. Yeah. 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 Um, and lastly, yeah. Thanks for answering that one. I hope that's uh, cleared up any. Any queries, Shamila? Um, I wanted to ask you a personal question just before we leave. In, in Whilst I was doing your kind of big five few exercises yesterday, um, something for me with stretching that maybe you could shed light on is that my hamstrings, if I really stretch my hamstrings to the point where it's kind of not, not painful but getting towards pain, um, it's one of the only stretches for me that actually makes me feel a bit panicked. 
Um, and I was wondering if you had any ideas about this because I've tried lots of different stretches, lots of different parts of my body, and I can push quite hard on a lot of different areas um, and not have the same response. But for some reason with hamstrings, I feel like it's kind of like a... How can I describe it? It's like a... It's like Claustrophobic. A, mm, yeah, actually, that's quite a good word. Yeah, it's kind of like a feeling of like... Um, that something really bad is going to happen, like um, like they're going to snap or something. And it's a real... Mm. I've just noticed that over the years that I feel it more with hamstring stretches than pretty much anything else. Um, Probably a vagus nerve, bro. <laughs> 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 there we go um, that's it. <laughs> it it it'd be interesting to see i think um uh so there's a good book actually which talks about this so anatomy trains so anyone that's into like um that kind of stuff like stretching and anatomy i'd recommend checking out anatomy trains but cool. essentially your your when you stretch your hamstrings, you're not necessarily stretching your hamstrings. You're stretching what's called like the superficial back line, which would be mm. runs from your hamstrings underneath your feet over to up into your suboccipitals up until the back of your head. So, I mean, what it could be is that there's, there's your your body just feels a restriction, just sort of panic. Um, but uh, I don't know. I don't know why it'd be your hamstrings specifically. Uh, to be honest, but I think it would probably be linked to this superficial back line because it does kind of go into the head and into the brain. So mm. um, that, in terms of that line of fascia, it just runs through the whole backside of the body. Mm. Um, but I know, like, there are some people um, who think that emotions are stored in in the body. Um, so in a lot of Chinese medicine, they talk about like anger in your kidneys or something like. I don't. I'm not sure. Like, I don't know the specific part so maybe there's there's some kind of trapped uh trauma in your hamstrings that you need to get out but <laughs> who knows I mean, um, I mean it sounds kind of kind of funny but it, you know it could be true i, I, I just have no idea with, without i don't know i haven't really investigated it much it's just kind of been a, a thing that i've noticed but mm. I, I i guess yeah it's just interesting to me because it has then put me off trying to uh, progress further with kind of hamstring stretching and things and I probably have mm. weak hamstrings as a result or maybe you know in addition to um... it could just be it, it could just be it just feels tight so the body panics it's like a natural reaction so just ease off and then like mm. go back to it but um, I, I mean I, I think that the in, in a certain like I, would, like I was kind of semi joking before when I was saying about you know bodies and the emotion but I, I do think it's there's certain things like if I'm scared, my traps will come up, mm. right? And that's like an involuntary movement. Or if I'm angry, you can feel blood rushing to your hands, right? Because you're getting ready to like either, do you know what I mean? Like fight or fly or something. Mm. So um, I do think um, that the body is kind of a reflection of your emotional state in some ways. And you can tell when people are like really rigid or if people are like loose mm. it says a lot about like their character and how they're feeling mm -hmm. so um mm -hmm. yeah i think the body is a reflection of the mind and of the emotional state so i'm not sure how that relates to your hamstring <laughs> well we'll see we'll see uh maybe yeah. i'll figure it out but um yeah thank you man i think i think we'll end it there is there any last sort of shout outs plugs um requests anything that you want to you want to dish out before we leave cool yeah so um uh if you're in the derby area and you're interested in personal training uh i do personal training services uh if you go to www.alphachimp.co.uk you can find out more there uh, i also do online coaching and i've just released a new ebook called the home workout manual so if people are interested in training at home um, it's kind of got creative workouts that you can do with if you have lying around at home like broomsticks and stuff like that <laughs> um but yeah so alphachimp.co.uk instagram alpha.chimp and you can find me there so yeah perfect perfect well thank you for coming on man i, I appreciate that and really enjoyed it man it's awesome yeah i'm glad you did i'm glad you did uh i think we we veered off into some 
interesting areas and I was trying to <laughs> I was, I, was, I was the whole time I was like, shall we keep going with this or shall I? Because I had like a list of things, and I was like, do I do I throw more or do I just keep going? And it's uh, it's always an interesting one for me as kind of an interviewer, judging on the spot whether to do that or not. So um, so thank mm. thank you for for running with me on that one. Um, but yeah, guys, if you're listening, then if you're listening on Spotify, you can click follow if you enjoyed this, and you'll be updated with new episodes if you're on youtube where you're watching us then you know hit subscribe you're not to do by now and you can find um more episodes coming your way um yeah if you enjoyed it then then please please feel free to share i i'm not making any money on these currently i'm losing money by doing all this <laughs> uh putting a lot of work in so yeah if, appreciate any shares that'd be great um but you obviously don't have to um so from me, thank you very much, uh, Eddie. And till next yep. till next time, man. Thanks. See you in a bit. Thanks, listeners. See you next time. Okay, there we go. Uh, oh yeah, that, that, don't worry. Um, I, I've got lots of editing powers in my hands that I can use. <laughs>